I'm a scientist here at the SETI Institute, and in addition to my own research, I also run our Research Experience for Undergraduates program in Astrobiology. This is a program that's funded through the National Science Foundation, and it's a long-standing uh, program that has sites all over the country. We are one of the few sites in Astrobiology. So this is a 10-week summer research internship program. We have students who have come here to spend the summer with us from all over the country. They're majoring in such disparate fields as biology, astronomy, physics, math, geology, engineering, chemistry, and more. And each student is paired up with a research mentor, either at the SETI Institute or at the NASA Ames Research Center. The students get to listen to lots of talks and lectures. They go on field trips to um, exciting places like Lick and Big Basin. Um, and we also have a grad school panel for students that, um, that'll be actually next week where they get to hear about um, the pros and cons of attending graduate school and get all sorts of tips on uh, where to go and how to apply and how to get in successfully. And we've had many of our students go on to either present papers at conferences or to attend graduate school. I was going through some numbers yesterday, and it looks like we've, over the um, past five years of the program, this is our sixth year, um, we've had um, close to 90 students who've, who've gone through the program, and about 40 of them are currently in graduate school. So we have a very good track record there. And this year we had field trips um, to um, Lick Observatory, where they got to do some asteroid observing. We also had some students who observed an occultation of the asteroid Antiope, and that's some of them in the middle on this slide here. Um, and they also went to Big Basin, and they got to see the coast as well. And uh, we do let them out of jail occasionally in the first image there. <laughs> so you can see them all here today. So we're going to have them come up in alphabetical order, and we're going to time them each for two minutes. And I'll ask my first student to come. Each student will introduce themselves. They'll give a two-minute overview of their research. Um, they've practiced these talks. They've been asked to stick to this two-minute time limit. So, yeah, like Adrian said, I ask you to hold your questions till the end. We can do a question session once all the students have finished. So, keep your quest, keep your questions for in your in your mind for which student you need to ask, and we can take those at the end. So, I'll call up my first student. Hi, I'm Christina Allen. I'm a student at the University of Mary. And this summer, I worked with Juana Marcu studying the response of extremophiles from the Atacama Desert to humidity changes. So this right here is the Atacama Desert. It's located in Chile, and it's the driest desert in the world. But despite this, you still have microbes that can live in halite rocks that are on the surface of the desert. And this right here is a halite rock that was taken from the Atacama. And the arrow is pointing to the black line, which is a layer of sand and bacteria that live under the surface of the rock. And this is a fluorescent microscope of some of the microbes that were taken from the rock. So since the Atacama Desert is so dry, this is believed to cause oxidative stress. So organisms that live in this area of such high oxidative stress have to have mechanisms that allow them to cope with this. And one of the potential mechanisms is the import and export of various metals, especially redox metals such as manganese, which have been shown to help scavenge the reactive oxygen species that cause oxidative stress. So we were looking at changes in manganese as a function of changes in humidity. So we found that when we decreased the humidity, we had a decrease in manganese concentration. And when we increased the humidity, we had an increase in manganese concentration. And this is nicely illustrated here in the graph, too. That's where we increased the concentration. And since this correlates so well to the changes in humidity, this leads us to believe that the manganese is in some way correlated and some way helps us, the um, organisms, deal with the oxidative stress. And another potential mechanism we were looking at is changes in gene expression. And... So if you have a lot of oxidative stress, you're going to need to theoretically upregulate the genes that help you deal with that. So genes such as your catalase and your manganese transporters will be more highly expressed when you have higher levels of oxidative stress. So by looking at changes in gene expression and changes in metal concentration, along with, as they, um, with changes in humidity, we can get an idea of what allows these organisms to survive the such harsh conditions of the Atacama Desert. Hey, hi everyone. I'm Conroy Baltzell from Carnegie Mellon, and my mentor is Friedman Freund. So, basically, solar radiation can excite neutral and ionized particles in the ionosphere and induce a current, as shown here, on the order of magnitude of 10 to the fourth amperes. During the daytime, you have 
a larger current in a smaller area at nighttime, vice versa. So you have a diurnal current that goes across the Earth, and you know, if you do the right-hand rule, you get a magnetic moment, and when you cross that with Earth's horizontal magnetic field, you get a torque. Now this torque, if you convert it to energy, can reach the equivalent of a magnitude 5 earthquake, which is theoretically sufficient enough to get these plates to jolt and create an earthquake. So that was the theory for on land and was proven to be correct. So what I wanted to look at is what happens underwater. How far do you have to go to get a shielding of that? So I looked at oceanic ridges and as you can see by this graph, which is all the earthquakes that occurred shallower than 10 kilometers, you see a pretty distinct diurnal pattern. However, when you t include all the earthquakes on that, ridges, on that ridge, then you see a basically gets completely shielded. Um, similarly, over here, similarly over here, you get a less of a diurnal pattern, but still a pattern nonetheless, which is for the earthquakes that are shallower than 10 kilometers. However, all the ones that are deeper than 10 kilometers form a completely unique pattern. So this is further evidenced by the fact that 90% of the earthquakes occurred in most ridges at 10 kilometers exactly. Therefore, the theory is that something is happening at 10 kilometers and we're trying to work out what exactly that is. Um, also, there's a theory that it could be due to the seismometers rounding, but that's highly unlikely for 90% of the earthquakes. Hi, my name is Sam Bonin. My mentor is Dr. William Barrett. I'm an applied mathematics major at the University of New Mexico, and my project is to study short-term variability of methanol masers. A uh, maser is a lot like a regular laser, but it's in space, and uh, it emits in microwave light rather than optical light. And uh, <clears throat> so the first step was to uh, reproduce some results for two masers found by the RU student last summer, and I did that successfully. Uh, you can see this is Maser G4949M. Here's the Maser line at 6.7 gigahertz. And here's the FFT of that Maser, which shows periodicity in that Maser line. Uh, the second step was to find more Masers. Here's a waterfall of one I found, G1268M. It was actually the only one I found. Here's the uh, signal to noise ratio of G1268M. And you can clearly see some periodicity here in the line. Um, I also decided to try some various new techniques for studying masers. Here is a continuous wavelet transform of G1268M, and this is supposed to show changes in the periodicity over time. Um, here's the lower frequency periodicity you can see that's demonstrated in this graph up here. And here's a continuous wavelet transform of G4949M, and I'm hoping this will tell us a little bit more about what may be causing this uh, variability in the masers shown. So. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ross Cawthon. I am a astronomy and physics student at Carleton College in Minnesota, and my mentor this summer was Dr. Gene Shire. And my project has been studying dust, small solid bar particles in space. And one of the interesting problems in dust studies is the difference between spectra of diffuse dust clouds and dense dust clouds. And the reasons for this must either be a difference in composition of the dust in these two environments, or perhaps in a dense dust cloud, the dust is growing to larger dust grains. And two of the most interesting, um, most studied absorption lines from dust um, are the ice profile at 3 microns and the silicate profile at 9.7 microns. So my project looked at just the dense pipe nebula in the K-band and L-band, but even though it's all ca classified as dense, we looked at many parts of the pipe nebula at very many different densities. Um, so a little of what I did, image processing, we looked at a target star that was behind the dust cloud and then a standard star not behind the dust cloud. And so you can see in these, um, these features are due to the Earth's atmosphere since it's both in the one behind the dust and the one not behind the dust. So dividing them gets rid of that and leaves just what's in the star and the dust. So I do that for the K-band and the L-band, and I combine that with Spitzer data from a previous student, and so we get a longer 
infrared spectra. So we can see the ice dip, the silicate dip. So then once we have this full spectra, I fit it with a computer model of a, a stellar model plus a dust model with a certain amount of ice and a certain amount of silicate. And we can analyze how much ice and silicate there is for different densities in this dust cloud. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ekaterina Komen and I'm a math and visual performing arts major at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. My mentor this summer was Cynthia Phillips and we worked on two projects together. Our first project was to create global maps of Ganymede Europa and Callisto using the New Horizons LISA spectrometer data. And we wrote a program that um, took out the LISA latitude, longitude, wavelength, and reflectance values, and then inputted those into ArcMap so we can see where on the surface of the satellites we have LISA coverage. Um, the ultimate goal of this project is to compare Galileo NIMS and New Horizons LISA data to see where on these satellites there were compositional changes between the two missions. The second project that I worked on involved trying to figure out the extent of geological changes on Jupiter's moon Io. And Io is the most geologically active object in the solar system um, because of all this volcanic activity going on. So by determining the extent of these changes on Io, we can better characterize um, Io's resurfacing rate to understand its interior and how the moon is affected by tidal heating. But there is a problem with this because um, the New Horizons LORI image, um, imager doesn't have an ISIS camera model, so we couldn't directly compare the Galileo SSI and the New Horizons LORI images. So we turned to GIMP for that and we edited a plugin to create the subtraction image. So we subtracted the Galileo image from the New Horizons image and got the subtraction image, which in these bright areas, it shows a brightness increase, and in the dark areas, it shows a brightness decrease. And then I also pointed out all the pixels that could have possibly been these geological changes. So all the green bright stuff is um, possible new bright deposits, and all the red stuff is possible new dark deposits. And with the future addition of um, a LORI camera in New Horizons, we can better make these measurements for active regions on Io. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Jennifer Cooper. I go to Cornell University. I'm majoring in physics, astronomy, and archaeology. And my mentor for the summer was Christina Daore. So my research focused on trans Neptunian objects. It's all these little dots that you see here in the Kuiper Belt region. Uh, they're icy planetismals that are remnants from the formation of the solar system. And some famous members include P Pluto, Sedna, Eris, and Makemake. And um, so my work uh, focused on a new addition of two wavelength bands. Original studies um, done by Fulci Ganoni and uh, my mentor, Christina, only had seven visual colors. And so my two new additions were from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was launched in 2003. It's an infrared space uh, observatory. And so my new wavelengths were at 3.55 and 4.5 microns. Um, this is uh, really important to us because all of these seven visual colors only go up to 2.5 microns. So we're hoping that these uh, two uh, wavelengths will hope to identify icy compositions within our objects. And so... Um, my analysis of the data of my 48 objects, which is shown in this graph here, um, is defining 10 classifications of the objects, which is new. Most other studies only had five or seven. And as you can see, taxa, taxon three and taxon eight, the very bottom here, have a different structure as opposed to the normal uh, curve that we have here. And so we're going to do further research on those um, two taxa, taxon. Um, hopefully they have some interesting ice compositions and maybe distinguish evolutionary trends between where uh, TNOs originated from and how they got there and what effects caused them to be like that. So, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Josh Pixel. I'm a student at Penn State University and I've been working with um, Dr. Jerry Harp and the characterization and classification of signals that are produced from or found by SONATA. So SONATA stands for SETI on the ATA, which is SETI's new autonomous um, 
program, which basically will um, select targets, observe them, analyze the data, and look for signals. And uh, what we've been looking at is trying to improve what it does. So one big problem with the SETI search is RFI, which is radio frequency interference. So we're looking for narrowband signals, which are produced by technology. So that would be a logical thing to look for. But the problem is that our own technology also produces these signals. So we have to find some way to um, factor them out, or factor out the um, RFI. So the current issue is that um, right now, Sonata will find a signal that it thinks is RFI, so we'll call it signal one. And then it will basically have a, a range of delta F and say, if we see another signal that is within that range, then it's RFI and it's the same signal. And we throw it out and we keep that for seven days. But that seems sort of illogical. And so here, signal one, two, and three would all be the same signal to Sonata, but signal two could be an ET signal that we're looking for. So we propose that, well, maybe we should be looking in some of the other parameters because Sonata will output time, frequency, drift, width, power, polarizations, the signal type, the beam, and the subchannel, and each thing should be characterized differently. Um, so what I've been doing is making correlation plots um, over the summer to sort of see if there's any relationship there. So the top one is um, number of signals versus the change in time. So I mentioned that the RFI was thrown out after seven days, and um, you know this would suggest that maybe only four hours or so would be a better range. You know, otherwise you're risking you know, throwing in an ET signal in there. And we've also been looking at you know, some of the other parameters, such as frequency, and notice that peaks here are possibly issues with Sonata. Hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Hicks, and I'm a student at Stony Brook University. And this summer, I've been working with Rob French and Mark Showalter on tracking clumps in Saturn's F ring. So this is an image of Saturn, and the brightest rings in the center are what you would normally see from Earth. And the F ring is actually just outside of those brightest rings. The reason we study the F ring is because it's dynamic, and it's dynamic on very short time scales compared to the other rings. It has two moons, Prometheus and Pandora, that interact with it and uh, contribute to a lot of the main features we can see in the ring, such as the core, which is that bright inner disk and then uh, some other features that you would also see in this image. An example of one of those features is a clump. And a clump is simply defined as an increase in brightness in one particular area with respect to the rest of the F-ring. So down that bottom image is actually a clump, and it's the brightest one that we've found so far. And my job is to go and find these clumps uh, over time and then track them. So this is a graph of um, brightness versus longitude of the F-ring, and for five different days over the span of about one month. And on each of these five days, we found a clump signified by a circle, and an example of which can be seen at the bottom there. And for those five days, we were able to track that clump over time and then figure out its velocity. And we found that it was moving at about 0.5 degrees per day with respect to the core. So it was moving 0.5 degrees faster than the actual core. And this implied that it was actually about, it was closer in than the actual core. So and we found that it was about 80 kilometers closer. And the, the goal of the project is now to expand on this tracking process and use this for about hundreds of other clumps that we found. And hopefully that will give us a better idea on how the F-ring is changing over time. Hello, my name is Laura Hosmer. I'm a chemical engineering and astrophysics student at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And this summer, I've spent working with mentors Christina Daliore and Rachel Mostrapa on using Cassini VIMS data to analyze chemical composition distributions of select Saturnian satellites. So here you can see is an image of Cassini spacecraft that's currently in orbit around Saturn today. The instrument I was primarily concerned with this summer was the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer. And when Cassini flies past an object, it takes raw data in the form of cubes that you can see up here. So the first step in my project this summer was to create mosaics from this raw data. This is an example of the moon Phoebe that I made in Isis, and it is composed of 15 separate cubes. 
And here you can see another mosaic. This particular one is of Mimas. It's made of seven cubes. And the second step of my project this summer was to analyze these mosaics to determine the chemical composition via cluster analysis. And what cluster analysis is, is it takes the entire um, spectrum, each one of these pixels in this mosaic represents a different spectrum of the surface at that location. So I averaged all these spectrum and separated them in this instance into 11 different classes based on similar chemical composition. So each one of the colors in these, this image over here represents different classes of similar chemical composition. And then I averaged the spectrum of each of those classes and plotted four of them here. And you can see the spectrum that is the dark blue and is most different from the other ones directly corresponds to this dark circle up here. That is the outline of Herschel Crater on Mimas. And so using this technique allows us to track different chemical compositional changes across the surface of these moons. Future work on this project includes doing both of these steps for other Saturnian satellites where VIMS data is available, and I plan on continuing this work in the future with my advisors here, as well as my advisor, Angela Speck in Missouri. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Tracy Mandel, and I'm a student at Cornell University in environmental engineering. And this summer, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Lori Fenton on a project involving GCM analysis of albedo changes following the 2001 Mars global dust storm. So albedo changes on Mars are largely due to the redistribution of bright dust on the planet's surface. And a study conducted by Mike Smith um, of data collected by the Mars Global Surveyor noticed that atmospheric and surface temperatures um, following the 2001 dust storm remained significantly cooler even after all the dust had settled out of the atmosphere. And it was postulated that this was due to the brightening of the surface by dust deposited. Um, so for my project, I hope to see if I could reproduce these results using the Mars Global Climate Model, or GCM, developed at NASA Ames. So I ran two runs of the GCM, one with a Mars Year 25 albedo map from before the dust storm, and one with the Mars Year 26 albedo map from after the dust storm. And as you can see from um, the output, there's a significant spatial correlation between areas that darkened became brighter and areas that, uh, or areas that darkened became warmer, areas that brightened became cooler. Um, however, there's not a very significant uh, change in the magnitude of these temperature changes. Uh, the surface albedo of Mars decreased by about 2% between Mars years 25 and 26, However, the output of the GCM um, does not show any significant decrease. So right now, my project is looking at um, whether emissivity could be a factor, as well as what magnitude of albedo changes would be required to reproduce the results observed by the Mars Global Surveyor. So thanks for your time. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wyatt ooh, Meldman Flock, and I'm a student at the College of William and Mary, and I've been doing some research under Dr. Bob Slauson and Lawrence Doyle. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some dolphin whistles and information theory. Um, basically, what I've been doing is creating a computer code that takes data and parses through the data to look for information, um, information content. So. Uh, information theory depends on, or in this case, depends on two specific things. One of them is Shannon entropy, which basically means you're getting across what you need to get across without repeating yourself. Um, it's kind of complex, and there's, I really don't have nearly enough time to talk about it here. So I'm just going to talk about the most general rudimentary case, which relies on Zipf's law. Zipf's law is a fundamental uh, little nifty mathematical trick where if you graph the frequency of different... Okay, in this case, let's talk about English. So in English, we speak in phonetics, so a phonetic language, so we use the alphabet. So what we look for is the frequency of different letters, per se, in some, I don't know, a paper. And we graph the frequency, the log base 10, of that frequency of a specific letter to the rank of that specific letter compared to other letters uh, of frequency. So the most frequent uh, gets one, least frequent gets the end of it. 
And if the there is language or information in there, uh, like coherently, it's going to give you a slope of negative one. Uh, if you were to take white noise or like baby babble, you get a flat line. And if you were to take, let's say, like a squirrel monkey or something that really doesn't have much information, then you're going to get a line that's below negative one and one above it if you're going to be repeating yourself a lot, like an Android or something. So right here, uh, what I've been doing is this uh, project is going to take dolphin whistles and look for their frequencies and try to find information inside their communications. Uh, right here, you see that the humans stay within the narrow band of like negative one per se. Uh, the dolphins are a little bit below that projected. Squirrel monkeys are above that, and squirrels themselves are way below that, like baby babble. Here's a dolphin whistle, and I'm done. Peace. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bjorn Mellon from St. Olaf College, and I've been working with Dr. Adrian Brown this summer, trying to understand the asymmetric retreat of CO2 ice on the North Pole of Mars during the spring there. You can see in this image from CRISM that there's an asymmetry in the CO2 ice. Most of it is concentrated in one quadrant of the pole, and there's really not a whole lot in these other quadrants. And Apare et al. suggested that that's because these other quadrants are being covered over by water that masks the CO2 signature. What we tried to do was reproduce this result in the NASA Ames Global Climate Model, or GCM. And here you can see an animation of the ice cap retreating in the GCM. It's pretty much symmetric. And we were just trying to get the GCM to deposit water on top of that cap as it was retreating. So the main question is, where is this water coming from? And Apare et al. suggested that it comes from a ring of water ice around the retreating CO2 cap, but we would like to suggest a different source, these outlying water deposits on the pole that are in exactly the right position to cover over some of these quadrants of the pole that CRISM did not see CO2 ice on. And in our model, these outlying deposits are uncovered at about the right time for, uh, at about the same time that CRISM sees the asymmetries appear in its data. When the uh, uncovering of these deposits happens, we see a, a large spike right here in the number of water condensation events on the quadrants where CRISM didn't see any CO2 ice. And if we remove the deposits, we see that the spikes are much more spread out and they're actually smaller. So we would conclude that the uh, outlying deposits are a very likely source for water to cover over the CO2 ice. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Mintier. I go to Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm studying pharmaceutical design and biological chemistry. I've been working with Mohit and Kabir this past summer to develop stereoselective protein-based chemo sensors. Um, the hope is that this technology can detect biogenic molecules in extraterrestrial environments. The sensors are also capable of detecting chirality. And what chirality is, is a property that of certain uh, molecules uh, due to the spatial arrangement of their internal atoms. Um, it's, it's something that's very important in biochemistry and believed to be a significant indication of, of specifically biotic activity as opposed to abiotic activity. Um, and uh, if you look at amino acids on Earth, uh, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. They're what we, virtually all life uses left-handed amino acids. Elsewhere in the universe, life could use right-handed amino acids. Um, but regardless of that, the stereoselectivity is believed to be an important indication of, of uh, biology. Um, the proteins I've been using are periplasmic binding proteins. They detect and transport nutrients across the cell wall naturally. Um, they have high affinity and strong specificity, and they have a major structural change that they experience when they bind their target ligands. Um, the graph shows the difference between uh, the open PBP versus when it's binding left-handed versus the right-handed glutamine. Okay. 
So we've been using FRET to measure this structural change, um, and FRET stands for Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer. Um, it takes advantage of uh, an excited donor fluorophore um, and the non-radiative transfer of energy to a ground state acceptor fluorophore. <laughs> so from the top graph, you can see that um, that our protein that we have been able to bind some right-handed glutamine. Um, Kabir previously developed a library that had about 6,000 uh, mutants, and I've screened about 800 so far. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maridel Phillips, and I'm a physics major at the University of Rochester in New York. And this summer I've been working with Dr. Peter Yeniskins on his CAMS project, which stands for Cameras for All Sky Meteor Surveillance. And this is just a low light um, level video network with the goal of establishing minor showers on the IAU's working list of meteor showers. So this is a map of our three locations that are currently collecting data. We have two at observatories, one is at Lick and the other at Freeman Peak, and we have one at a winery in Lodi. And this is also a picture of the camera setup that we have at each station. They're all a little bit different, but each one has 20 of these Watek cameras. So I've been involved in the data reduction on this project, and this is sort of the process that I go through. It starts by collecting the video files from each camera station, which are compressed into four-frame format. We write these files to hard disk and then bring them here to SETI, where we manually calibrate each night individually using astrometric software specifically written for this project. And then we run these files through a reprocessor, which compiles all the potential meteors and their orbital elements, and then we have to manually separate the real detected meteors from the false detections using a program called Coincidence. And the important part is using the information from Coincidence to map the geocentric coordinates of each real detected meteor, because this shows where the meteors come from in the sky. And so clusters, such as the ones on this diagram, indicate meteor showers. And um, you can double check that by isolating those orbits and looking at their orbital elements and things like their speed and inclination to see if they're similar. So this is data from May 1st. And uh, the cluster on the lower right is the Eta Aquarids, and then on the upper right is actually a shower that I detected called the April Rose Cygnids, which is on the working list but unestablished, so we are in the process of confirming that right now. And this project also confirmed or found an entirely new shower called the February Eta Draconids, and that was found this summer. And then this last picture is our total data, which is over 7,000 orbits now. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Roger Sheck and my mentor is Dr. Richard Krenn. Um, let me start off with a little bit of background. Back in the late 1970s, NASA sent, oh, NASA sent um, the Viking landers to Mars to search for life. And although there are some scientists out there that believe that they detected life, the general consensus is that um, the Martian regolith is chemically active. There have been um, experiments done using superoxides and peroxides um, to try and explain the Viking labeled release and gas exchange experiments. And then in 2008, Phoenix discovered perchlorate on Mars. And because Mars does not have a magnetosphere, we know that perchlorate will break down with ionizing radiation. So it'll break down from chlorate, perchlorate to chlorate to chloride, hypochlorite and chloride, and possibly as well um, generate superoxides and peroxides. So the goal of my project this summer was to determine whether um, superoxides and peroxides are present in gamma irradiated samples of calcium perchlorate. Um, so in order to detect it, I used um, a method that involved adding different solvents to a sample. And before I worked with real samples, I had to validate the method. So I used um, calcium peroxide and I added each of these in sequence to determine the origin of um, whether it had oxygen or superoxide or peroxide in there. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that our reactions evolved oxygen, which was measured using a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. So um, a, little about my, about, eh, a little bit about my results. Um, I kind of had a lot of variability when I first started doing that. I had about 10% to 50% yield. And just last week, we made a breakthrough, and I was able to get like 100% yield. 
So in conclusion, I validated a method for detecting peroxide in gamma irradiated calcium perchlorate samples, and the future work is to analyze the actual samples. So thank you. Hello, my name is Alicia Shugart, and I am from the uh, I'm a, an astronomy and physics major at the University University of Texas at Austin. I've been working with John Richards on a public outreach project for SETI. Now, what I'm trying to do is revitalize the SETI Quest Explorer program and engage public participation and participation from software developers or uh, open source contributors. I'm just I'm using uh, social networking programs like Facebook and LinkedIn and um, to keep these people engaged as well as uh, employing or opening the lines of communication on our own website using blog and forum exchange. Now what I have here, I also employ uh, the Google Analytics program which details the um, website users, what they're doing and where they go. I use this to create funnels to actively engage uh, the website viewers and track where they're going. I've also created a little human interest aspect to illustrate the dynamic sciences that are going on here at SETI, as we've seen over the last 15 presentations. Down here I have photograph, or I have a screenshot of the Microsoft Worldwide Telescope layers I'm trying to create. There's a similar one for Google Sky, but this Microsoft Telescope is much more dynamic and opens far more lines of community for creating tours, interacting with other people who are interested. What I have mapped here, the layers I have mapped here, are the um, Habcat stars, which are stars that have, um, or potential stars for exoplanets. The ones marked in red here are uh, stars that SETI has actually looked at. What I'm trying to do is really just communicate to the public that it's not only scientists who contribute to science. Citizen scientists and programmers are very, uh, very useful contributors to science and what we're trying to do here at SETI in general. Thank you. And that's it. Let's give all our speakers another round of applause. <laughs> And they did, such a, they did such a good job sticking to their strict two-minute time limits that we have time for some questions, um, either for me generally about the RU program or other student internship programs, um, or questions directly for the students about their science. Lawrence. The black rock, yes, the, yeah. the clump is migrating. So the non-temporary orbit is the clump or the core? Uh, the clump. A couple of students mentioned the, uh, uh, I guess, a Mars global climate model um, that NASA aims. And I'm wondering, is that something anyone can download? And would it run on a personal computer, or do you need a supercomputer? Um. Ooh, that was very loud. I apologize. <laughs> the the version of the Mars GCM that Bjorn and I are using is a relatively advanced and um I guess CPU heavy uh program, but I believe on the the NASA Ames Climate Modeling Group has a website of their own and I think they have a one dimensional sort of Mars GCM that you can download um and the public can use there. But as far as I know um, the GCM that we're using is not. <laughs> it, it took us most of the summer to get it to work, so it it it, it just kind of re requires some compiling and configuring and stuff like that to get it to run. But I think they do have a website where they're uh, slowly releasing portions of it to to public use. Yeah.
I had a question for Wyatt about the dolphin language. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so you said uh, you're identifying, you know, repetitive signals like we use letters. So what would, you know, in our written language, so what would the, the equivalent be in, in the dolphin signal processing of a letter? Hey, um, as you guys saw, I wasn't really able to talk about my dolphin whistle slide or part of the slide, but uh, basically, so let's take a look at like a letter. Let's talk about A. A has a specific sound to it, right? Like A, ah, ah, eh, like whatever. And basically, instead of just representing things like A, since I was just looking at some text data when I was making my code, um, we're going to look at specific frequencies, like actual sounds, instead of just numeric equivalents. Or not, not numeric, but like, you know, letter equivalents, I guess. Um, so yeah, the specific frequencies are going to be put in a text file and plugged through my program, and then you get some data out of it to use. So yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about the future of the IU program at the SETI Institute? No, this was not a planted question in the audience. It was totally voluntary. Uh, yeah, so so this is the sixth year of our, our, our REU program here. Um, we're, I'm currently, you know, as of today, I'm writing the renewal proposal to the National Science Foundation, so I'm hopeful that we'll get refunded for another three years. Um, we've had some great results. We have lots of publications, lots of grad school admittances, as well as, you know, just great science that's coming out of these summer projects, so I'm pretty hopeful. And... Yeah, so basically, if any of you are students or no students who might want to apply for our program, watch our website. Um, toward the end of this year, we should have more information up in about December about our program. The application deadline is usually um, big, usually end of January, early February, um, and we notify students at the beginning of March whether or not they've been accepted. It's a very competitive program, so you know if you or a student you know applies and you don't get accepted, you know please don't feel bad. It's not that we don't like you; it's just that we get probably about 10 times more students applying than we could actually accept. We got over 150 applications last year. And as you can see, we can only accept about 16 students each year to our program. So yeah, if you have any other questions, you can um, visit our website at www.seti.org slash REU. That has information about this year's program. And that's the site that will be updated with information um, about the application for next year's as well. And if you guys, if any of you are a SETI Institute scientist, you might want to mentor a student in this program, you can contact me as well. Students are accepted based on really a number of different criteria. Um, they have to all have a very strong academic background. As you can see, they come from a really wide variety of majors, um, and we recruit at schools, we recruit directly at schools all over the country. So we're pretty proud that we have students from you know many different states, um, many of whom perhaps have never been to California before. So we're very glad to, you know, indoctrinate them into how wonderful Northern California is. Um, but yeah, we, we look at, it's really a match between each individual student and a project. So on their applications, um, there's a list of um, offered research projects for the next summer. And each student ranks their top three projects. And in their essay, they indicate why they think that, why they're interested in those projects and why they think they're qualified or suited. And then what mentors do is they look at the students who have ranked their project as one of their first three choices, and they select their top student candidates from those choices. Um, and so it's really, you know, it, 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 it becomes a balance between academic qualifications. You know, you have to have a strong GPA. You have to have a good level of background. The students are all either have finished their sophomore or junior year of college. Um, so it's academic preparation, but it's also research experience. Um, it's really important at the undergraduate level to get involved in some sort of research project. Um, so some students come from large universities and have had the opportunity to get involved in research you know, during the academic year or in previous summers. Some of our students come from small liberal arts colleges where there isn't really a very active ongoing research program. And so programs like this really help engage those students in research. Um, but we do look for students who have done research in the past, um, at the very least who have done some sort of more unstructured laboratory-based courses um, as part of their classwork. And we also look at, you know, students who have had to overcome certain hurdles or barriers or from underserved populations or from rural schools. Um, those are also characteristics that we look at. Um, but it's really on the, on the individual decision of each mentor to choose which students they think would be a good fit for their project.
Um, I had a question for Laura. I was wondering why Herschel was had a different spectra. Was it because it's younger or excavated different kind of material? Um, that's actually a really good question and is still ongoing research. Um, I think the main thing that came out of it having a different spectra is it's it dug down below the first few millimeters because that's what the spectra are that BIMS takes. So I know that Christina and Rachel are using the different spectra that comes out of craters to study like the weathering effects on the planet. And so I think the reason that Herschel like stands out as a distinct different class is because it's it's the spectrum of what's under the first few millimeters of the surface. So weathering effects of So thank you, thank you to the students and also to the mentors for all the hard work that you do over the summer. Um, and I think that you guys will be should be very proud of all that you've done. And next week um, in this room, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings, the students will be giving longer versions of their research talks. And so if um, any of you, if your interest was piqued by these brief two-minute um, overviews, um, please come along next week and um, hear some longer versions. So Monday, I'm sorry, Monday and Wednesday morning, starting at 9.30, talks will be in this room. Friday morning, we'll be upstairs in room 234. So if any of you guys from outside SETI are interested, please just stop by the front desk on Friday morning and they'll let you in upstairs to come hear the talks as well. So thanks a lot. Oh, and one more comment. <laughs> Thanks very much, Cynthia.